So the goal of boiling it is just to get rid of the chlorine. Um, chlorine has uh, one ion of sodium in it and we wanna remove all the salt from the water so that you're in charge of where the salt goes into the process. Um, you know, when you go in the pool and your hair turns green in the water, even my hair turns green and it's dark, um, you wanna get rid of the chlorine because it's gonna have some effect with your dye that you're not gonna be as in charge of the results. And it usually ends up tilting it towards green and a lot of black dye already leans green and it looks kind of swampy in my opinion. So you have to already kind of counteract that black anyways, the, the green in there. So you just want to get rid of that at the beginning and boiling it is the easiest way to, to get rid of that. Yep. Okay, Heather. Um, I find that boiling works the best for me. A lot of times I'm wanting dark colors, so need the boil, but I have a propane heat source under my water outside, so it helps counter the outside cold, but it is very hard to keep it boiling. And I use just a, a little thermometer. I bought it like a food cooking kind of place that goes up, you know, super high that I can just use real quick. Um, I haven't noticed a big difference with I mean, I haven't tried like tap versus distilled, but now I kind of want to try it because I didn't know about the chlorine thing until this morning. <laughs> so now I want to try it. <laughs> but I find heat is very effective if you want dark colors. Very good. Yeah, I learned about this chlorine from Adrian this morning too. I had no idea. That's And that's the wonderful thing about this is getting lots of different knowledge. You learn lots of different things. Okay, next question. Oh, here it is. Do you dye before or after alterations or does it depend on the type of dye technique being applied? Okay, let's start this one with Heather. Sorry, I was reading a question that popped up in the chat. What was your question? Uh-oh. Okay, well, what was the question in the chat? Because I always miss those. Oh, um, how big was my pot for my vat? It's um, about I want to say it's like a 15 gallon big metal thing I bought at Home Depot. I have to buy multiples of them because over time the sealant from the heat starts leaking. I buy lots of them, but <laughs> I'm working on updating that. But that's what I use. My husband just built me a little propane heating source for it. Um, but that's all I use. I'm trying to figure out better ones, but. So far, it's the only thing I've found that's big enough with enough surface area and wide enough opening to get a dress in, so. Very good. Okay, now let me read well, you the, the question. question. The other question. Do you dye before or after alterations or does it depend on the type of dye technique being applied? Um, I would say it's very situational. Um, we talked about it this morning too. And uh, um, I've done it before and after, but there are things that, you know, will change like where the dye hits. You know, if you hem it off or you hem it at the waist, it can change on an ombre. Um, or, you know, if you're dyeing the whole dress, if you have to let it out later, you might not have consistent colors in your side seams. <laughs> so it's probably something you wanna do first. So it's definitely something you just gotta like think about before you attack the project on what all needs to be done and alterations before you dye it. Very good. Okay, Natalie, same question. Yeah, I, I approach each project on um, case by case. So depending on whether the fabric is one that I anticipate shrinking or stretching, uh, whether the bride anticipates altering her length uh, and yeah, and whether we're doing an ombre or an all over. So uh, the one thing that, that I have noticed is that uh, the details from a bustle um, can sometimes dye differently than the base dress. So for that reason, I'm almost <clears throat> starting to lean toward doing alterations afterward. But in that case, um, I have to make arrangements or give them advice on how to mark for me so that I know what our end waist to hem measurement will be. 
and I gauge from there. That was a really complicated answer. I'm sorry. Is that clear? <laughs> well, it is complicated because I don't know it. I think the big thing is ombre, if it stretches way out, like you were talking about before chiffon, when it gets wet, stretches with heat and it really does. Um, your ombre, you could lose your ombre at the bottom completely when you hem that if you're not anticipating what your waist to length measurement is on there. So it's, it's complicated, but important as far as that. Okay, Adrian, how about you? Um, I agree. It's also kind of based on what you're doing. Now, normally I'm also altering the dress that I'm dying. So um, I can kind of look at it in some phases. Um, but the, I had, I was remembering this morning, I could, there's a different example. One of the first wedding dresses I ever made way back in the day, she wanted to dye it afterwards. So I was um, cotton lining that was perfect for dyeing. It was prepared for dye fabric, so it didn't have any um, fixatives in it. There was no sizing or anything. Um, so I got it, everything like ready to shrink in case it was going to shrink later. Um, the Blackberry dress that um, was used as an example, that one, that dress needed to be let out even before we started on it. So I just, I opened all this, the side seams and the front seams, everything that I was going to need to let out. I opened everything before I dyed it so it would catch into all the, you know, all the fabric and lace that I was going to be needing because that just made more sense to me. So <laughs> I'm taking her dress and fitting her in it and it's all, it's all open. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, and then I dyed it and we did a second fitting on her to like, check everything and make sure because it, it can shrink, you know, if you're, if you're actually boiling it or um, I haven't had too much, you know, bad luck as far as that goes. Usually it's the bride's measurements that have changed the kind of thing. Um, but I do, uh, before I do a whole dress dye, I'll measure across it just and write it down just to cut my baby because I want to make sure I didn't like lose the half more because sometimes that happens with all that does it and you're not flipping anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I would agree that it's kind of case to case. If I was doing a hem, you know, I'd probably want to get it in place first and then do the dye work and stuff like that. So yeah, just kind of case to case. Okay, our next question. The thought of putting a dress in the wash is scary. What dresses would you not wash and do you use something like Sandberg to prepare the dress? And also, I had a question on this and it goes along with this. So I'll put my, someone asked me about my bag that I wash my dresses in before and after I do the dye thing. This is, I think it's like for making athletic jerseys or something. It's just, uh, let me bring it close to the, can you see that stuff? And I just folded the entire yardage in half and stitched down one side. I used to have a drawstring, but it doesn't work very well. I like to just knot the end after I get the dress in it, turn the dress inside out and stick it in this bag and put it in the wash. And it just, it just keeps everything happy. I just, and it's a really ugly color. It started out white, but I've used it a lot when I dye dresses. And so it's every once in a while, I'll put it in the wash with bleach and clean it up a bit, but obviously it's been a while since I cleaned up my bag. I've had that forever. All right, um, let's see, Natalie. The thought of putting a dress in the wash is scary. What dresses would you not wash? And do you use something like Synthropol to prepare the dress? Yeah, okay, so on all things um, chemical, I'm probably gonna defer to Adrian. I depend <laughs> a lot more upon um, heat and technique than my chemistry, um, but that might be about to change. I'm excited, thanks. Um, as far as things that I'll wash or not, um, I, I sort of quit being so delicate about it. And at this point I'm like, well, if I'm willing to dye anything, like <laughs> there's, a, there's a certain level of, uh, uh, of like delicacy that you're bypassing. So I'll wash <laughs> just about anything with the exception of stuff with a, a raw chiffon edge. Um, if that's going to leave it looking like significantly more shop worn or something. Um, but again, like if we're, if we're dying it, that's, that's kind of a given. So at this point, like, I mean, I washed my silk dresses. I just did, I do like four or five runway shows a year. You guys, if I didn't wash dresses, like 
to to dry clean uh, like a 24 piece collect like nobody has that kind of money I don't care what kind of brand you are so no <laughs> literally everything has been washed um silk and otherwise so that's where I'm at it might be a wrong answer but that's my answer <laughs> it's a good answer it's a real answer okay Heather well, um, I think the only one I avoid is silk just because it still scares me and I'm afraid of ruining something that somebody's. Um, but I put just about everything in my washing machine, but I got a washing machine that doesn't have the center. Agitator. Yeah, that's the word. Thank you. Um, the agitator in it. So it's just a big open basin and I find that it's safer that way. Um, but I always turn them inside out. If it's got like lots of beading and stuff on it and I'm worried about it kind of disintegrating or catching on itself um I just use like a big old plastic tub in my you know bathtub and just do it that way um and then I just sometimes I'll just run it through my rinse cycle on my washing machine so it gets all the liquid out so it can hang dry without watermarking um but I, yeah, I wash about everything. Hey, I so conquer that by, uh, I sew a sheet of organza over the beading and then I'll still throw it in. So oh, there you go. That the works. Don't scrape that works. It. Yeah, that's good. Okay. And by the way, Heather, I think we all have envy of your washing machine in your outdoor um, cauldron <laughs> that you dye your black in. I think we're all a little jealous. And want to, I have to get a new washing machine anyway. My other one broke, so I thought of it <laughs> when getting a new one. Okay, Adrian. I'm definitely jealous of your call when I'm going to write a letter to Santa, but I also need one. <laughs> um, but so I worked in, at a dry cleaner when I was in high school, and the shop that I work at now, we wash the floor samples because they get nasty from being dragged around and tried on. So I've seen what they look like when they're washed multiple times. And they can get really gross when they're washed multiple times, but that's not the scenario that most brides that we come across will have. So it's definitely safe to wash the wedding dress. If you're really worried about it, like um, Heather was saying, put it in the bathtub and just like low agitation, just kind of like pounce it in the water to get the stuff off of it. You don't have to go like crazy, you know, with it in the washing machine if you're really worried. Um, the only thing that I'm really like still nervous about is rhinestones with like the little prong uh, holders on them just because those are super scratchy and I forget the name of that technique now where you put the you know a sacrificial piece of fabric over to kind of protect your your decor like, there's a name for it and I can't think of it right now um so I've done that before on rhinestones but I still I'm still making nervous because they can poke right out so that's one where I would put it in the water um and kind of just bounce around and get all the debris loose and you know the soap through it and stuff like that and just let it kind of be flat versus you know tumbled and all that good stuff. Um, crepe kind of bothers me just a little bit because again, the snagging. Um, but um, I don't think I've done a lot of work on a base crepe in a long time to get super crazy about that. That was more something I saw at the dry cleaner and you had to be really careful with that. There's a lot of stuff um, that I saw that is actually like wet clean <laughs> at the dry cleaner. You wouldn't think you think dry cleaning, well, it's some sort of magical process with like powders, you know. Um, but there was a lot of stuff we did in tubs or basins over there, were big uh, sinks that was actually wet process. So when I saw that, I was like, oh, okay. So there's a lot of things you can do that's wet and not scary. The only thing, and I, someone just mentioned it right now about um, beads melting or whatever. There are some types of pearls that will disintegrate in chemicals. So uh, we have, for example, we had buttons on men's shirts. There were certain ones we had to look at them and be like, mm, those are going to melt. So we would take them off before dry cleaning and then put them back on because you could just, after a while you just can kind of tell they have a feel and a smell to them and you're like, these are gonna disintegrate and come over. So pearls could be that factor, but um, I can't think of what chemical would dissolve that that you use normally. I think most people wash um, with like oxyclean or, you know, a Fells bar or something like that. Nothing, you know, that's gonna be crazy. So I wouldn't worry too hard about that. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna answer a question from the chat. It says, I'm confused about the bottle tea, assuming there is sugar in them. Does the sugar crystallize? And I see that Natalie helped it. She uses unsweetened usually, 
And also you rinse it out. So you're rinsing the sugar out if there is sugar in it. Um, so that, I hope that answers that question. Okay, let's go on to our next question. Um, can you discuss some of the pricing of different dye jobs? Okay, who wants to start on this one? Let's have Natalie. Natalie, I loved your answers last time. And they just you want inspired. Me back on my soapbox? Okay, so what I, what I didn't mention this morning is um, I have standardized pricing um, and I charge based upon quantity of colors, which color, um, fiber content, silhouette. Um, so it's like, it's not a small um, chart, but uh, I've got that on my website so people can see pretty much like what their project is going to cost. Uh, the challenge is like the average consumer doesn't understand what fiber content is. So we usually end up needing to have a discussion anyway, and that's fine, um, but my my thoughts on pricing are uh, it seems like this this is the entirety of the room that has people <laughs> providing this service. So um, I I celebrate the idea of charging what you need to charge, and that's where I'm at. <laughs> you said it was a luxury. Um, it's a luxury artisanal luxury service. service. So it took, it, it took my best friends pointing this out to me that to have number one bridal customer service or customer service on the level of like anybody where you have a, a customer who's entrusting their item to you, that's, that's special in its own right. To have the uh, finesse artistically to be able to get smooth blends um, to be able to get something that's not splotchy, like that's a smaller Venn diagram. And then you're throwing in this third, like textile chemistry, like the fact that I have those three skills that overlap is pretty rare and special. And so I, and I do not have the courage to do it, having the courage and the guts to do it too. Right. And we talked, we talked a little bit earlier too, about how, uh, I started, I started this as a side sort of like, this was a side business and it's very much, it's taken me by surprise and um, we're actually leaning into it stronger this year than our old core service, which was custom design. Um, but I got to that point of confidence because number one, like I wasn't desperate for a sale, which always helps with pricing confidence, <laughs> but also I had spent months casually experimenting, uh, ruining a couple of Goodwill dresses and playing around with lots of different fabrics and different colors and variables and techniques so that now when I am meeting with somebody, I can say, okay, yes, your, your skirt is polyester organza. I know what that means for what you're asking from me, um, which is a different position, I think, than if I was to have started and been like, I think it's going to be okay. Just trust me. Um, so yeah, long-winded answer. Sorry. Final answer. <laughs> good answer. It's a good answer. And I think the practicing on samples and Goodwills is important. Okay. Adrienne, tell us I your love, thoughts on pricing. Sorry, I'm, I'm reeling. I love that answer because it's so easy to forget how far you've come, not just only as a seamstress, but like any part of our craft that we do, um, nobody does this stuff, like, or to these levels either, to where you, like, you don't need to be nervous to charge what you need to charge because who else is gonna do it? You know, it's, um, usually the people that find me can't find anybody and they're like finding other people and they're like, oh, I know who you need to talk to. So that, that factors in and like, it's so easy to forget that because it's something you've worked on for so long. I've been working on dyed projects since I was like 19, I like, turned 35 this last year. So that's a significant amount of time to be experimenting and ruining things and figuring things out. And um, yeah, it's just funny to like stop and, you know, have that moment sit in your head and go, wow, it's a lot of experience. But um, my, the way I answered this this morning, I kind of liked, because I, um, obviously each project is a little bit different depending on how much of the dress you're handling. Um, 
whether you're, you're hauling it indoors, outdoors a lot, if you're putting it on your table and it's kind of a little more contained. Um, I kind of try to think of the whole project as how much time, obviously, how much time you can take, how much effort is the bride of pain? Is she going to want to see progress for the, uh, do I own these colors already or do I need to charge them for the colors? Because uh, sometimes they want a color I don't have. And so I just I have to charge for that. Um, I don't give them their extra material back when it comes to dye. With most things I do, if they bought um, something and I had extra, like if they've got rhinestones, I'll give them back their extra rhinestones or whatever. Um, but with dyes, I don't, because what are they going to do with it, honestly? So um, if you're going to start working on, uh, you know, providing this as a service to people and you want to practice, um, I would build up your collection a little bit maybe, but, um, you know, you could always throw maybe a hundred bucks or so at getting some dyes in a bin and, you know, give yourself some practice and stuff. But um, yeah, get some stuff from Goodwill that you can practice on. I absolutely love that. So you can kind of get a vibe for it because it can be scary. Um, I remember one of the first rests I ever dyed, it was beaded. And I looked at my, um, I had a really great uh, mentor. And I looked at her and I was like, what if I messed it up? And she goes, you can't mess up unless you start. So get that in the, in the bucket. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, I'll just get it started then. Um, so if you're thinking about giving it a try, just, just give it a try. What's the worst that can happen really? And um, my biggest thing is working kind of in phases with the color, building up the layers, um, and then going from there, showing the bride like at their next fitting, how is this looking? Do you like the richness on this? Do you need to go one more layer? That'll be X amount more dollars because there's more you know, labor involved and stuff like that. So kind of involving them in the process a little bit so they can kind of connect with it and they see effort goes into it and it's not just like one thousand dollars you know they can see okay i'm going to do step one we're going to do this coat this much and this you know part this much money whatever and i like that too because it gives them a stopping point so that i'm not just spinning my wheels if they already love it i'm not going to go further on it um the black fairy dress for example was supposed to be a black dress and I told her no first because i was like oh i don't have her. i don't have the energy right now black dress um so i said okay here's what here's what i'm gonna tell you i said no black dress comes out black because we're gonna get somewhere in the range of black brown green black something like that um i can't guarantee it's gonna be black and she said okay that's so we went forward and it turned out kind of a blackberry color which she ended up loving but had i not had that conversation with her i would have gone harder and spent more effort on it getting it black so I'm going to talk about that ahead of time because then I didn't put too much money in for the price that I gave her. Um, so I ended up being profitable, which is great. So um, it's, it can be hard to step back and look at all the unknowns ahead of time. Um, but there are so many other steps involved with it. There's, you know, the swatching. Obviously, we have vats and propane that there are costs that are associated with that as well. Um, I haven't broken down what that would look like as part of the, you know, the cost, the, you know, form. So that would be something because there's, you know, more stuff you need to buy. So as long as you're getting your supplies all covered, if you're learning and you're still trying to get confident with it, you know, as long as you cover your time comfortably, you can start charging more for it later, I think. That's kind of my vibe. Okay, good. Okay, Heather, give us your opinions on this. Pricing. Um, I'd say as far as like my website goes, I'll tell girls that like dye starts at 100 and it goes from there kind of my baseline because I have to buy dye and it's expensive um but yeah I kind of I price according to like how many colors they want if they want like multicolor ombre how many bottles of dye I gotta buy you know if they want a darker color it's gonna probably cost more because it's gonna take me a lot longer and a lot more dye to get there um versus like a cute little lilac ombre is pretty simple can handle that um so yeah I just kind of go by time and how much supply I gotta buy to get where they want me to get and I kind of give them just a chunk of a price and I always do a like a little test dye first and something of their fabric so they can kind of tell what it's gonna look like and give a guess and I always make them sign a form that says this is very experimental and it may not work exactly how we want it to <laughs> just to cover mine, my butt mine has a checkbox <laughs> after the swatch so they say yes I like the results that I saw on the swatch it's a good one good, good one and I think prepping them 
ahead of time educating them that it is um, an adventure and yeah. that you know, results are not guaranteed is great. And I think also for building experience, you can just use a piece of fabric, just use fabric that is common in your bridal shop or bridals that you, different ones too, because tulle and satin and chiffon, they all take the dyes different and just makes you more comfortable knowing what to expect. And so expect, if you want to do this, to train yourself and take that time and take those dresses. I think Goodwill dresses, the more different materials on the dress, the better teaching experience you will have, um, seeing how the different um, laces take the dye compared to the fabric or lining and stuff like that. So, you know, you can train yourself that way and by practice and learning. And it's a fun skill to have. And I just saw another chat one. Natalie, I really appreciate how you're on top of this. Someone asked, do you advertise that you provide dye services or wait for brides to ask? And Natalie said, oh, heavily advertise. And um, so that's, yeah. Let people know that that's a service that you have. And I'm just now adding it to my website with a whole page. Awesome. Mostly it's word of mouth right now and slightly mentioned on my website. <laughs> well, anyone that looks at your website, um, Heather, will see that you die because you do a lot of unique um, artistic things on there. All right, let me get to our next Let's see. Oh, do you rinse the tea dye fabrics and how do you get it to set? I will answer for Diana since she's sick. She does rinse them out and just rinsing it out pretty much stabilizes the color. You'll see what color it is as soon as it's rinsed out. It, a little bit of the color comes out when you rinse, but that's okay. And so that's that. Okay. I've got, I'm sorry to do this, but I have a question that and this is one that I wrote to myself. Dee Dee, what do you wish you had included in this symposium but forgot? <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's my question. And my answers are, A, if it's unmanageable, remove the crinoline um, lining and there's usually a lining layer that all the crinolines um, stitched onto. You can either if you want to leave it off forever, just remove the crinoline before you start. If you want to put it back in for a very billowy, remove it from the, I mean, the usually about mid hip and above, about three inches off, cut it off. And, um, and if you want it dyed, put it in the dye after you're done with the other because it'll take longer to, but remove that and it makes everything more manageable. And number two, if you don't have gobs of dyes on hand, you know, like when mine started going purple, I just ran upstairs and grabbed teal because I have every dye under the sun and added that to with, so that the green would neutralize the purple, the pink or red going into that. Um, and if you don't have a ton of different dyes, get a red, yellow and blue so that you can mix into whatever color that you need to pull. I have a, color, color wheel. Sometimes some people just have a natural color wheel in their brain and know what they need to do to neutralize. But if not, get a color wheel. And if things are starting to turn a random color and you need to balance it back out, use your color wheel so that you can see what you need to do to balance it back to the color that you're supposed to be getting. So I pulled it back to navy by adding some green so that that purple it, it pulled the purple out because there was some red and pink coming through. And so the green in the teal pulled the purple out and it turned back into the blues and just kind of color correcting. And so that, and that's part of the experimenting that you can do and learning it. It's not all just the fabrics, it's about the colors and how to correct 
when they go a little bit funky because they do a lot of times. So let me see. Oh, storage and disposal. We missed this in the first one and I just about missed it this time. Um, Adri, would you, Adrian, would you like to talk a little bit about storage and disposal of dyes? Yes. Um, sometimes my friends are like, you're, you're kind of like serious, <laughs> but it's because I've seen things that happen that are not fun. One of the shops I used to work for, we actually got um, a dumping fine. It wasn't me that was dumping, but we got a dumping fine for dumping paint and dyes outside. I did not know this was happening um, and it was not cute. So um, there's a proper way to store and dispose of your dyes. I don't actually dispose of most of mine unless it's a hideous coat I'm not gonna use ever again, but um, I've found that they're helpful to save even for color correcting because you never know when you're gonna need something to tweak another color um, and get it back to a good shade. Um, so my favorite things to store in are plastic. Uh, I save my distilled water gallons. I'll usually let my dye evaporate down to half from a big batch, if it's too big to store, I'll, I'll get it down to a gallon size before I'll store it. I just let it evaporate out a little bit in the sun and then it, it stores just fine. Uh, it's not enough to do a whole nother dress with again, but it still has you know purpose and function, so I save it. Um, if you're going to be disposing of it though, um, you wanna get like a cheap bag of kitty litter. Like, I wouldn't use a dollar store one, it's not very absorbent and it's not a great value. I know it's a dollar, but it's not really quite a lot. Um, get an inexpensive one, spread it out, put your dye over it and let it absorb and then just put it into the trash. Really, it's not going to get into a water source or anything like that by accident. Um, that's the proper way <laughs> to dispose of it. But most people that I know that do any dye work do save their dyes just to, you know, use them for tinting or for a smaller projects or something. I also really like um, Gatorade bottles because they have kind of a hard wall. Um, as long as your container doesn't have metal on it to store, because the chemicals will explode the top off eventually. Uh, and I do usually need to burp the lids on my jugs every so often. Just to, you know, that's how chemicals work. But I haven't had one explode, so that's good. It's not cute when a bottle of dye explodes and then you're like, oh, what happened here? So, yep, that's my that's my tips. I was curious if anybody else saves their dyes because I don't. I might just be a hoarder. I, I think I just seems to us. I think most of us are a little bit hoardery. Is that correct or is that just me? I uh, have about 45 gallon buckets lined up currently in the lab. So when I do a formula that I really like, yeah, I get very hoardy. So I did like, I stumbled across like the perfect marigold uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not getting rid of that. But the ones that I use fairly often, if it's a small quantity, I'll just toss it out. But yeah, when you're making a vat that's like 10 gallons, uh, I don't find that the color gets exhausted until like maybe end of dress two, like dress three, it's not as vibrant as when I started. Um, so, you know, you have to factor that in too. And when I've I've started to make records of like some of these favorite formulas. So if I know like, this is how I make the perfect teal, but the blue that I'm pulling from, I've already used thrice. Like it's not as reliable at that point anymore. So yeah, I get enough variety with orders coming in that like, I still hold on to a bunch of stuff. And you are absolutely right that you need to pay attention to your local laws and regulations. And even if your municipality does not mandate that you do responsible things, make sure that you research for the particular dye you're using. I try to use all non-toxic, as green as possible stuff um, whenever I can, but the truth of the matter is some of these colors are a little more challenging to, to reach uh, organically. So kitty litter when you need to, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Heather, have you got anything to add on that? Not really. I actually messaged Adrian after the first session to ask more about it because. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I they do more uh, of it. <laughs> someone just asked if they lose their vibrancy. And yeah, they do. They 
it's not like a half life, they're not like half as bad, but like if you do standard alterations, for example, if you ran a wedding dress through a black dye batch and you save one gallon, you can um, like freshen up someone's black jeans with it. You know, yeah. so there's enough to get like a refresher item and then you've made some money and then you've gotten, you squeeze all the juice out of the dye that's possible. I used to do in the summertime, I would do a promotion where I would um, have everybody like get ready for winter with all their black stuff. And I would put together a big batch of black dye for pants and shirts and whatever they're gonna do and I just put it all together into one thing. So um, black is one of those colors. I think if you're gonna start, get the red, blue, yellow, the basics and I get black. That's just my key though, because then you can get some different you know, shades of everything as well. I used black once, honestly. And then the second time it's just like, it just won't push past charcoal even on an ideal fabric. Um, but because I'm a crazy hoarder, I'll hold on to it still because um, exhausted black is a really pretty lavender. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Tragically, yes, we know that. <laughs> Okay, we have another question that says, will dyes lose their vibrancy over time? And I think you've kind of covered that a little bit, Natalie. What do you, what do you say for that one? Obviously black turns lavender, uh -huh. what else? Um, I mean, anytime you're storing like a liquid over time too, like I don't keep them forever, they get gunky, so. I, I haven't decided what the shelf life is, but it's definitely not six months. <laughs> also okay. Houston though. So like, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is not a problem in Idaho. <laughs> I'll have to try. I don't know. Okay. I mostly, I mostly just trust my nose. If it doesn't smell good, it's probably not good anymore. So if I open something up and it don't smell cute, I'm not gonna dye the rest of that because it smell cute anymore. Because you can't get that out. That's not going anywhere. Okay. Um, do we have any questions from our audience? Okay. Let's see. Chris had her hand. Oh, we have a lot of questions. Um, Matt, maybe start with Chris. Can you unmute her? Okay. All right, Chris, I, he's, I think he's getting you unmuted. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. There, you there go. we go. Hi. Oh, actually, I just sent it through. Have you ever used an airbrush to for um, effect and does it work? Michelle, we were talking about this. Good question. All right, Michelle. Michelle, do you want to answer that one? No. Or, or Michelle, are you muted? No. Um, Michelle was saying, not Michelle, Heather. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Heather, I keep telling you that. Why do I do that? Heather. No. Yes. Yes, Heather. Um, I haven't tried airbrushing myself, but I really want to try it. Um, purposely because I always get the picture of the sunset dress which I'm sure lots of people have seen um the one that goes like yellow orange purple and I'm always like I can't put purple over a warm color it'll turn brown um because that one's airbrushed with paint instead of dye but I would really love to try it I don't know if anyone else has Natalie have you tried I, um, I actually started my business, the dye lab anyway, um, because of that viral sunset picture that was airbrushed. Yep. And um, that bride went on to start a whole airbrushing side business for a while um, and doesn't anymore, curiously. Um, I'm, I'm a fabric snob, so I'm not going to say that airbrushing is like I, I don't think it's for everybody. I appreciate the hand of a fabric and putting paint on a fabric completely changes the character. What you don't see in those photos 
is that you're taking a soft tool and turning it into like a piece of paper. So it's not going to work for every style. Um, and, uh, and frankly, like my bills right now are getting paid from doing that dye sunset. Um, so it absolutely like, I've come to the conclusion that I can do about any color combination. So long as where the two colors meet, um, it's not, it's not muddy. So I won't do a yellow into purple blend. For instance, um, I usually end up leaning into a print solution for for a request like that, but I dye, I dye everything. Have you, has anyone tried like the airbrush with the dye in it though? You can only versus see, okay, the paper. It wouldn't work for polyester no. because True. you need True. you need that extended heat. So it would work well for silks. Right. Nobody's paying me for silk dresses. So no. <laughs> power to you if they are. Okay, Adrian, what about you? What are your thoughts on the airbrushing? So uh, about a million years ago, I used to face paint um, and I was sent to a job where I had to airbrush tattoos onto people. And it was then that I discovered that I am trash with an airbrush. It is not an intuitive tool for me at all. And um, yeah, I, I would like to think that you could get a result with it. I just don't know what that would be and how controllable it would be. Cause again, you're losing the heat. Um, you could try a wet on wet, but I also know that the, the viscosities of the two are different, the dye that, versus the paint that goes into the airbrush. So I don't know what you'd have to do to amend it, to get it to be the right thickness to aerosolize properly. Um, it might, like I said, it might have a really cool, I just don't know what it would be or if it would be as controllable. Um, I have control problems because I paint really expensive dress. So um, I want to use a really nice um, natural hair brush and I want to paint just where it should be, you know, just right where the edge is. I want to get exactly in the cracks. I want to blend it on purpose. So airbrush is a little bit too organic for me as far as what I'm trying to do. Um, it would be cool to try, but I'm just, I'm remembering that day where I'm like, trying to hold the, the switch down on an airbrush. And I'm like, I can't, <laughs> that was very clumsy for me. So that would be a, that would be a no for me. I have never airbrushed with the dyes. Okay, does that answer your question, Chris? Okay, all right, who else had some questions? I better look at some other pages. Does anyone wave your hand or something if you've got a question? Anybody? I'm kind of blind. <laughs> Kathy? Does someone yeah, I just Kathy? put in the chat, but um, okay. can they, can the sunset be achieved with a hand brush, like a manual brush? Only on silk. Or Only cotton. on silk. Yeah, okay. you need oh, natural an extended fibers. heat for a synthetic. So that really eliminates a whole lot of creative possibilities that you would be doing by just quick touching something. The exception is sometimes but can't nylon, you can't but... you heat the well, can't you heat the dye and then dip and it in keep, the brush or no? Keep it boiling for half an hour. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just the problem is it has to be hot on the fabric. Yeah, so it just not might be color fast. Hot. Like it it might shed off. Like you might be able to paint it on hot and let it set and not fix it but you're not really giving them like an heirloom quality piece at that point and like if you're doing an armpit and you're not closing the fiber back off they might mm -hmm. end up with dye on their body afterwards so as long as you're telling them hey you might crock when you wear it like if if a bride really really wants it they just have to have it and you can't tell them no for some reason just that you're going to end up like all your sweat areas are going to be dyed along with your dress are you okay with that? Because your honeymoon, you're going to have armpits that are sunset colored then too. So as long as you're okay with that and they're aware of it, um, I guess that's fine. You know, we've all had bright like that where you look, I really don't want to do this, but you're not going away, are you? So, okay. You know. Makes sense. Okay. How come I have never seen this viral sunset? 
dress. Obviously, <laughs> I'll show, I'll show you mine. Now I'm going to have to look it up. I want to see yours. Um, Ooh, oh, yeah. is that it? That's mine. Heather, that's not the one that went up? viral. Uh -huh. But that's not the viral one, but that one's great. No, Beautiful. that's isn't it? it? Isn't it, Heather? Is that one of yours? No. Oh, that's not yours. Whose is that one? Yep. That I think it's Natalie's. That was me. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. That was beautiful. Here's uh, was very Taylor Ann Art. Credit where credit's due. She's she's the yep. one that started the viral sensation. And yep. uh, bless her heart, she's still making the dresses, but now she just makes whatever she wants and posts those, and you buy what she makes. And she's an artist, yep. and I think that's a brilliant approach. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> no custom orders. Um, but no, yeah, so so that's she, she has the yellow going into orange. So she's not muddying it. She has the pink going into the purple. So she hasn't she's um, airbrushing paint. This is paint. That's not dye. That's airbrushed. Right. That's versus, airbrushed paint. Versus where's my hey, wait a minute. I think I have that on my gallery, don't I? Do I oh, have that probably. On my I mean it's viral, so it's probably come across your stuff. <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know it's that. Achievable, just not with dye. That's all. Yeah, it's. I think it's still a good inspiration. Yeah, I've seen people do that with capable with that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, all right. Well, we have gone over our time limit, and it's been so fun. I hate to even break this up because this is really fun. I'm going to have to look into this more. I do. I think I've got one on my gallery. Maybe. <laughs> That'll be interesting to see. Thank you so much to our guest specialist, our panelists. Really so much good information that we've got from you. And thank you to all of you that have come on for the webinar tonight. This was really fun and I really en enjoy your input. And this is going to be recorded. So we will be emailing it out to you later. So if you didn't miss the morning one, you can watch the morning one. If you missed the evening one tonight, we can you'll be able to watch both of those. And I appreciate so much all that you guys have done and your support. And I appreciate my symposium sponsors and the guest panelists and everyone that's come. I've just had so much fun with this symposium this year. This was really a fun one with the dying wedding dress. Super fun. Thank you so much, everybody. And bye-bye. Mm -hmm.